Hello, let's make some dreams come true. This is Christian Howes. I'm excited to present this, this virtual version of this, uh, this theme today, which is slow thinking versus fast thinking. The duality of teaching harmony versus creative improvisation. I love that I'm getting to do this today because I present a lot of different separate modules related to improvisation, contemporary styles, and uh, related subjects. But when you study any one of these modules, you sort of miss a big part of it. And so today, really highlighting the contrast between these two important modules, slow thinking, fast thinking. Slow thinking is a learning process. When we're memorizing something, when we're learning something for the first time, there's a lot of memori memorizing and internalizing that goes on versus fast thinking. Fast thinking is the type of thinking we do when we're either expert at something already. We've already learned something. Like if you've played a hundred games of chess, then you think very fast. If you've played the violin a hundred days in a row, then it's easy to put your fingers down. Um, fast thinking also shows up for things that are instinctual. Like if you see a predator, you know, you know, to look away. So, um, <clears throat> fast thinking in, in this regard today is going to relate to creativity. So I want to make a really important distinction between how we pr uh, teach and practice musical creativity versus how we learn information like harmonic information could also be rhythmic information by separating these two and really getting this big uh, important distinction it's going to make a huge difference and i hope that you're going to walk away from this presentation looking at like life before this moment and life after it so let's get into it i'm going to start with fast thinking how we can practice and teach creativity and uh, don't worry, you're going to get all the other stuff you think that you want to get uh, a little bit later. But let's talk about the creative process. What we want to do to ensure that we're doing fast thinking and that we're actually being creative is, first of all, we want to make sure that whenever we're being creative and practicing the creative process, that we're doing something we already know enough. So a little more about that i'm going to take you but first of all i'm going to take you through an icebreaker so i want you to just follow the prompts that i give you and play your instrument um <clears throat> so the first prompt of the icebreaker here what i'm going to ask you to do is just play one note i would say an open string open a is a great one what i want you to do is play open a with this frequency the note about like that there's going to be no rests you're not going to play any other notes and within that i want you to improvise i'll demonstrate this briefly it'll be like this so within those restrictions you can improvise and be as free as a bird just try that for just um like 10 seconds ready go Awesome. You should have noticed that there's only a couple things you could improvise, right? You could improvise your bow stroke, your the direction, the articulation, the volume, maybe a couple other things. Now for the next level of this, um, teaching creativity, uh, I'm going to change the, the prompt. So this time you can play the note D or the note A. We're going to use the same tempo, we'll make it a little faster. Da, da, da. So for example, you could do... Etc. So do that for about 10 seconds. Ready? Go. Great. Okay, the next prompt, we're going to use any of the notes that are that occur in the D major scale. So you can think about two sharps if you want C sharp and, and F sharp. Um, however you want to think about it, we're going to use the same duration, da, da, da. So for example, for example, any notes in the key of D major about this tempo, ready, go.
Awesome. Okay, so for the next step, we're going to use the same tempo, um, no rests, again, everything else the same, but now you can use all 12 notes. For example... For example, like that. I want you to go a little bit longer for this one. I do it about 15 seconds. Remember also that as you follow these, don't read into this. Do not read into this. Just do the exercise, do the task. Ready, go. Awesome. Let's do a couple variations now. Let's add um, rests and let's change the, um, the meter. So let's turn it into triplets. So we'll go back to the key of D major and we're going to do triplets at about triple it, triple it, triple it. And you can introduce rests. I'll give you an example. Etc. Ready? Go. Awesome. Remember, you can always pause this as well and try these for longer periods of time and record yourself as you do it and listen back later. So let's do the same. Um, uh, version we just did, but now let's do it with 12 notes. So for example, so 12 notes with triplets, recurring triplets, and including rests if and when you want. Ready, go. Great. Again, I'm just going to move fast so that if you want to pause, you can. You can take more time with these exercises. Uh, for this next one, we're going to have you do, um, this time you can change the tempo, you can change the rhythm, and you can use rests. Um, yeah, you can change the tempo, you can change the rhythm, any, as much as you want, and you can use rests. So, for example. You try it. Awesome. And again, you can pause this and you can do it again. What I did was I took you very quickly through the icebreaker. Um, the very last exercise was actually free improvisation. There were no rules. So let me just explain how this works so that you as a teacher um, or as a student can uh, understand how to create your own scaffolding around this. What we did was we started with very strict limits, right? Just one note, one tempo, no rests. The reason for this is we really want, in order to train ourselves to be creative, first of all, we don't want to be freaked out. <laughs> um, we don't want to have to learn anything new to be able to be creative. We want to have very clear instructions and ideally a choice between this and that. Because a lot of times what we learn is in school is to do tasks and to follow instructions. So as much as we can make this creative exercise about following the instructions and making the choices limited between A and B, that is a real natural catalyst of the creative process. And it might even feel boring, but feeling like it's boring is the opposite of the intimidation and the freak out that a lot of times people feel with the creative process, right? So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help you and or your students to not feel freaked out about improvising music. So that's why we start with rigid structural frameworks, rigid rules, 
um, because the more rules, the more clear the choices and the limited choices that we have, the more free we feel to make a creative choice. And what is creativity? It's just a matter of choosing. You choose what note, you choose how long, how loud, how short, what comes next, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that is the icebreaker. Um, now, a couple other related things to this icebreaker. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take you through something called free association next. Okay. Free association. I'm gonna say a word. I want you to say a word, and I want you to say the first word that comes to your mind. Just remember that the first word. Uh, word that comes to your mind is the correct answer, okay? And if you're doing this by yourself in your own space, then there's no reason you shouldn't feel comfortable hopefully doing this. Um, so here we go. You ready? Here's the first word. Music. School. Teaching. Violin. Pizza. Tennis racket, street corner, America. Okay, you get the idea. This is free association, right? Now we're going to do it with our instrument. So I'm going to say a word, and I want you to play the first thing that comes to your mind. Remember that the first thing that comes to your mind is the correct answer, okay? And you can play as long or as short as you want. I'm going to give you a little more time than I did on the verbal one. So, first word, are you ready? Angry. Sad. Remember, I'm gonna say a word and you're gonna play the first thing that comes to your mind. Here's the next word. Confused. Relaxed. Happy. Tired, afraid, awesome. So I'm sure you noticed that all of those words had something in common. They were all feelings, emotions. So I'm just going to make a couple comments about uh, some of the benefits that I think come from using emotions or feelings as our prompts, our, our these creative prompts, a structural. Uh, lifting off point, if you will. Um, the thing about what I like about using emotions, again, remember that with fast thinking, um, with creativity, we want to be operating from a space in which we don't need to learn something. We already know what it is. You already know what an emotion is. All your students know what angry and sad and happy, what that is. So when I'm asking you to improvise and play the first thing that comes to your mind, there's no, there's no, there shouldn't be any barrier there as long as you feel comfortable expressing the first thing that comes to your mind, right? Which I realize is tricky for people because there's a lot of judgment that's happening often when it comes to the creative process. And so I want to offer just a couple other more ideas about that, how to overcome this judgment. We do not want to be trying to make something good. <laughs> you know, it's like I said earlier, don't read into this. Don't make more out of this than, than what it is. Just follow the instructions, right? Um, when it comes to emotions, what I like about emotions and feelings is that we can really, we get to really examine the reason why we play music, right? There could be many reasons why we choose to play music. It could be because we we want to be popular or because we want to um, get a college scholarship. Um, it could be because we think we're going to make a lot of money or we like the community that comes from it, right? But it could also be just about how we feel, you know? So this to me feels like a therapeutic exercise. So playing for therapy just to be as a conduit of the emotions that we feel. So just remember that there are many reasons to play music. There are many reasons to improvise and be creative and not just for the sake of being great, quote unquote, whatever that is. Let's just try to suspend our judgment about what is quote unquote good music just for a minute. Can we just do that? Can we agree upon that? 
<laughs> so, okay. The next category of free association. I'm going to say a word and you play the first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? All right. Bouncing bows. Long bows. String crossings. Pizzicato. Double stops. You can go back to Arco now. Shifting, shifting. Vibrato. Harmonics. Great. So obviously, what is the thing that, that is uh, about all of these words that I just gave you, these prompts that I gave you? They're all related to right hand or left hand technique. So right hand and left hand technique is like a second bucket of parameters that I use to um, facilitate creativity. Again, if every kid knows what a violin is, it doesn't mean that they know how everything about it, but they know what it is. They can experience it. And you can experience the idea of a bouncing bow, of a long bow, of a pizzicato. Um, maybe harmonics is a challenge, right? But any kid can understand shifting on some level. So we're using the instrument. We're using the right hand, the left hand as um, this category for um, structuring creative games. Now, one of the um, things I like about using techniques is again, going back to what I said earlier, that there are many reasons or intentions um, or even focal points for our awareness when we play music. And one could be about practicing techniques, discovering techniques. So when we're improvising a bouncing bow stroke, If I'm bouncing the bow for the purpose of understanding the bounce and getting to know the bounce, that's very different than improvising with an intention of trying to make something that is clever. Do you see? And so we want to, again, suspend this self-judgmental um, thing that we put on <laughs> about like, I can't improvise unless I'm making something great. Just let's just let go of whether it's great or whether it's good or not good. Because as one of my friends told me, if you want to be a composer or if you want to be an improviser, what you need to do first is improvise a hundred times and get a and hundred pieces and throw them all away and then you'll be an improviser. Compose a hundred pieces and throw them all away and then you'll be a composer. What I think he meant by this is that we just need to engage in the process for the sake of it for a while and then we can bring this more critical evaluating faculty to it so hopefully that makes sense okay so <clears throat> what i shared with you were emotions and then techniques these are two of the buckets that i use to draw parameters and that is how i um, guide the creative process you can use one of those like the word sad or like bouncing bow stroke, or you can put two of them together. So it could be long bows, um, angry. Long bows and angry, right? It could be bouncing bows and happy. Bouncing bows and happy, right? So it could be one parameter, or it could be multiple parameters. Now, the third bucket <clears throat> that I use is, I just call music. And within that bucket, we used some of these earlier. We used some of these earlier. I wanna um, just bring you back to remember the icebreaker. We used tempo. We used <clears throat> rhythm, the duration of notes. 
Uh, we also used pitch or melody. You can also use harmony. You can use phrasing. Um, you can use density, style, groove, any element of music that you want, you can bring into bear. So for example, D major, the key of D major. I might play in the key of D major, but then also bring an emotion and also bring a, um, uh, a technique. So let's do bouncing bows, D major, sad. For example, right? Or I could say fast, you know, like, or BPM 200 <laughs> and all eighth notes. So that's a rhythm and it's also a um, tempo. And then I could say, um, I could add a, a, a key signature if I want or not. I could say 12 notes and I could do um, with slurring the bow, which is a technique. example right now you can string these together in suites so you could say okay for 20 seconds i'm going to do this and then i'm going to do this for 10 seconds and then this for a minute and there's all kinds of directions you can go with this you could do it in uh, collaboration with other people or overdubbing on top of yourself but this is basically a primer in how i teach creative improvisation um, especially when we are taking out um, any any um, specialized knowledge that you might need to have, like, for example, about how a tune is constructed or like knowing a specific song or knowing a chord progression or knowing certain scales or knowing certain rhythms or certain, you know, licks from different styles. This is about pure creativity. Um, and when you practice this, you're going to develop more and more confidence and and uh, freedom of expression for yourself. And when you teach it to your students, they're going to develop it. What is really critical is that you, whenever you engage in this, that you always do it at a level of knowledge that is comfortable for you or a level of technique or familiarity. So you do not want to ask a student to do this in seventh position in the key of F sharp major, because if they don't already know that really well, it's not fair. It's not the same that point because they need to learn F sharp major and they need to learn 10th position. Now you could say to a young student, go way up here and play whatever you want. Now that's totally fair, right? Because they know how to go up there, but you're not asking them to play in F sharp major. That wouldn't be fair. There's a lot more on this, a lot more detail that I provide in my courses, um, in a lot of my YouTube videos a lot of my teacher training courses that I offer. So you're welcome to reach out to me, chris at christianhouse.com, visit my website, et cetera, et cetera. But what I want to do now is I want to move into this other direction where we talk about internalizing, internalizing harmony, internalizing rhythm, internalizing scales, so that we can bring this contrast between these two processes. Because when you really understand all of these in an overview and how they relate together, you're going to see how they rely on each other so much and why this entire area of our field is so difficult for classical musicians and why they get often uh, overwhelmed and intimidated and confused. So now let's talk about internalizing harmony. Um, we're going to start with internalizing the scale because I think it's a little easier. I've got this loop here. So this this particular loop that I set up is about four chords. But the reason I set it up is so we can just play one scale. So it's a, it's a B minor, but you don't need to know this. G major, then A, and then E minor, right? Now the thing is that over this progression, you can play notes from the D major scale. You can pretty much get away with playing any notes from the D major scale. Now, you can't do that everywhere, but on this progression, you can. And this is the focus of what we're going to do right now. So what, what I like to think about for the D major scale, we all know that it's this. But what I would like for you to do is just simply write down the key signature, F sharp and C sharp. <coughs> Because whenever we look at music in orchestra, we look at the key signature, and then we apply A, B, C, D, E, F, G to that key signature. Now, if you 
what you want to be able to do is see the scale a b c d e f g everywhere that a b c d e f g occurs in first position on your instrument and apply the sharps so for violin it would be here so for every scale that i play i want to be able to play it like that in first position extended range and what we're going to do is just play some simple patterns over this scale until you kind of get the gist of this, okay? So we'll go G to G, you can do it with me. A to A. B to B. C sharp to C sharp. Let's go down from B. So it's just a simple sequence. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Not different from a sequence that is often asked on the SAT or the ACT tests, uh, standardized tests for high school students going into college. And it'll be something like complete the sequence. So if we think of a number for each of our scale tones, no matter where we are, one, two, three, four, then we can make these simple sequences. So let's try one, three, four. Five. Okay, starting from G, ready, go. A, B, C sharp, D, E, with me, F sharp, G. Let's go down from E. patterns we can come up with, just very simple patterns. And this is a way of internalizing the scale, memorizing the scale. And this is just a very short, um, but hopefully it makes sense. You can take a lot of patterns. And if you want, you can also take a loop like this. And by the way, I have over a hundred, uh, sorry, 200 <laughs> play along lessons on my YouTube channel um, for all levels and many styles. So you definitely want to find those, but I'll have loops like this where I guide you through and then, then you get to do your own thing as well. So, but if you, if you listen, maybe we can try something where we just go back to playing notes in D major, any of any, uh, any sequence that we want, randomizing it, right? And you can take whatever tempo you want. So you could take this tempo. <laughs> exercise. Why don't you try that? Or you can take it twice as slow or twice as fast if you want. So twice as slow would be like this. Like that. We're back to the or twice as fast. Or you get the point, and uh, um, maybe at the end, I'll let this loop uh, just play out a little bit. This is about internalizing a scale internalizing a scale, just memorizing sequences so that eventually we can abandon the sequences, but we want to find every possible pattern on the instrument. And I'm not saying that a sixth grader needs to do this or that you do, but what I'm showing you is that aspirationally speaking, we could do this with thirds, you know, sixths, sevenths, Fourths, uh, seconds, you know, etc., etc., tenths, octaves, whatever you want to do. 
Um, so that's a little bit about internalizing the scale. The thing about internalizing the scale is that's going to be useful for you in some situations, in some musical situations, but it's going to fall short uh, in other musical situations, which is why ultimately we want to be able to deal with internalizing harmony in the sense of voice-led chords, voice-led triads, and even later on bigger chords. But we'll start with triads. And this is going to be the last, um, but a very important segment of this presentation. You're going to want to use the handout that has chord stacks from Paco Bell's Canon. And what I'm going to take you through is just uh, going through these chord stacks. So hopefully you have the chord stack for Paco Bell's Canon out. And the first step that we're going to take is we're going to play a note from each chord. So you see where the letter D is. Underneath the letter D are a stack of notes, which are th the three notes in the D major triad, but I put them in an extended range, right? And the reason I do that, that's very important that you stack them in extended range so that you can see the voice leading. So we take one note from D and then we take one note from A and it doesn't matter which note, you just choose one from the stack and you try to look ahead. Let's do it a couple times, are you ready? So here's D. A, look ahead to B minor, look ahead to F sharp, look ahead to G, look ahead to D. We'll just do this a couple times to the G so you can get used to looking at the stacks. Back to the top, here's D, look ahead to A, look ahead to B minor. You don't have to play my note, you pick your note. D chord, and then G chord. Now let's try to pick two. Two notes from D, two notes from A, two notes from B, two notes from F sharp minor, two notes from G, two notes from D, two notes from G, A. You try it. Two notes from each chord. Or stay with one. Here's the B minor chord, F sharp minor chord, G chord, D chord. G chord and A chord. Very nice. Now you can take this further if you want. You can play four notes per chord, eight notes per chord. You know, so let's just let's just you continue to play what you want. One note per chord, two notes per chord. The big idea here is what? The big idea is that you play a chord tone and it always sounds good. A chord tone is the best melody tone, period. Um and uh, why is that so hard for us as string players? Well, because we, we just have never paid attention to it. <laughs> Nobody ever told us to pay attention to it. And that's why we suffer from that deficit in our musicianship. And what I'm showing you right now is how to stop suffering from that deficit in your musicianship and how you can pass this on to your kids so that they're not afraid of it the way that we were. Um, now, we can do, as I said, I might do four notes per chord, but you can stay with one or two, okay? Ready and go, um, sorry, ready and go and. notes how many chord tones per chord do you want to play sure g d g a good now for this this next level we're going to play the chord tone on the strong beat play the chord tone on the downbeat of the chord and in between you can do whatever you want i'm going to let you hear what it sounds like so chord tone on the downbeat of the chord and then in between until we get to the next chord you can use anything you want it could be more chord tones it could be scale tones from d major or it could be chromatic tones you try it ready and go and One 
more time. Awesome, awesome. Now, for the next level of this, we're going to look at how once we have this chordal information, this harmonic information, we can then look at different styles of music and we can start to examine what's different about them. And here's a hint. The harmony stays the same. What changes is just the rhythm usually. So, for example, if we do this as a, um, a bluegrass tune... We've got our bass line. Uh, well, no, we'll do our we'll do our inner voices first. So we'll do run pony, run pony. That's our inner voices, and I'm just taking two notes from each chord, voice leading them with stepwise motion. And that's our inner voices. And this is our bass line. And the bass line is just playing the chord tone. I mean, you could do other things, but it's always pretty much going to play uh, the root, rather, of the chord on the downbeat of the chord. D, D, G, G, A, A. You can add a little. So if we want, we can play um, in that rhythm, run pony, run pony, or we could do something a little more exciting like, let's try that. One, two, ready, go. G chord, D chord, G chord, A chord. take other rhythmic tendencies from the bluegrass tradition so for example something like this All right let's try that one one two ready go you try it the idea so we have the same harmonic information which is given to us in these chord stacks these visual uh aids which is a great way it's like training wheels on a bike it helps us stay up on that bike until we don't need them anymore and once you have that chordal information you can then figure out your bass lines your inner voices your melodies your counter melodies it's all within the chord tones the bass line has specific rules. The, the inner voices has specific rules, things like when to voice lead, when to play the root of the chord, things like this. But it, you would see that if we went from bluegrass to a waltz or to a Latin groove or a funk groove, all of these things are going to hold somewhat. In other words, the chord tones are still going to be that foundation for everything we do. And all we're going to change is looking at some of the rhythms that we use, the rhythms we use in a bossa nova will be different than the rhythms we use in a bluegrass tune, which would be different than rock and roll or EDM. So once you have this harmonic piece, it allows you to then navigate between different styles and to think about the differences which are fundamentally rhythmic. Um, so we talked about how you can internalize the scale by memorizing patterns and this, this sort of thing. How do you memorize the chords? Well, the way you memorize the chords is you start with this sheet right here that I gave you and you allow your kids to, to work off the sheet and you work off the sheet when you're trying to do exercises in arranging or uh, tonal improvisation. Um, and this way you start to become accountable for the harmonic information all the time. 
caretaking for the harmony. People who are playing the melody all the time and never paying attention to the harmony aren't responsible for the harmony. So you can begin to be responsible for the harmony by giving yourself these visual aids, right? And by following the visual aids. But if you want to eventually memorize that information, you can take the visual aid and you can memorize, you know, a D triad like this. You know, not just this way. But really, really knowing that it's those three notes everywhere they show up. And then you can find the, the dyads within there, which is going to be fourths and thirds, or by skipping one in between, that's your sixth and fifths. You can find your triple stops. That's close position triple stops with thirds and fourths, or your spread position triple stops with sixths and fifths. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna learn each triad, major or minor triad, in all of those shapes that I just showed you. And then you're gonna know that, that chord really well from seeing those different shapes. And the next step after that, and this, by the way, is all very aspirational, a little more advanced, but this is stuff that you can do. The next step you're gonna take after that is you're gonna voice lead just any two chords. So for example, we might take D and A, and I might voice lead the arpeggio, such as D, A, D, A, D. Always voice lead. Right? Or all those other shapes that I showed you, like D, A, D, A, D. Or this shape, D, A, D, A, D, A. Once you can, once you can voice lead these common, you memorize these common uh, pairings, one to five, one to four, one to seven, et cetera, et cetera. Then you can take an entire progression, such as Pachelbel's Canon, and you can play it in all these shapes and express this harmony on the instrument, you know? So Pachelbel. So this brings us to the end when I'd like to wrap up and again point out this contrast between internalizing harmony on one side and why it's so important and how you can do it much quicker using this these visual aids, which by the way, you can get much more in-depth training on all of this at my website or by reaching out to me again, chris at christianhouse.com. Join my teacher trainings, my seven-week intensives, all this sort of thing. Uh, I've got tons of free trainings on YouTube as well. But um, I have courses devoted to easy tonal improvisation where I do master classes with high school students and uh, trainings with teachers, really taking you through so many really cool iterations of what you can do with this uh, on the uh, harmonic internalization side. Um, and on the creative improvisation side, as I showed earlier. Again, bringing to bear this, this, these are like kind of two different pillars that we want to address slightly different ways uh, from the, the standpoint of fast thinking and slow thinking. From how we approach um, nurturing creativity and facilitating making creative choices, focusing on what we know, which can even be non-tonal, right? It can be non-tonal. We can use 12 tones. We can do so many things with our instrument. Um, and I've got a lot of examples of that as well on my, on my YouTube channel. Again, you can look, reach out to me for more examples. Um, but going from the creative side, where we're just focused on creating things and developing a personal language of expression and getting beyond the judgment and these prejudgments of what makes it musical or what makes it good or not good. A lot of times, um, these are just more based on familiarity. You know, it's like if you've only ever eaten grilled cheese in your life, grilled cheese sandwiches, then as far as you know, that's the only thing that's good. And it's the same thing in music. We want to really have this really open palette about what's possible and what, you know. Uh, for example, if I was to play um, an improvisation like this, 
Well, a fourth grader, if they heard that, they might think, well, actually, I think if a fourth grader heard that, I think they would think it was cool. But a ninth grader might think that's weird, right? Because they've been like indoctrinated <laughs> to think that music is only these certain sounds. We want to go the other direction. We really want to go to this, to this anything is possible from the realm of creativity. Um, and then eventually we can bring that back in to, um, to our, uh, our um, more tonal and uh, familiar landscapes like this. <laughs> So if, if, if I've got this, this uh, progression here that's based, based off basically the D major scale, I can bring all of those creative parameters to bear, right? So I could think, um, you know, um, I can think short phrases. these things do come together. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope that if you'd like to uh, um, get some continued um, learning on this, you reach out to me, chris at christianhouse.com. Remember, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I've got so many trainings uh, related through Creative Strings, our nonprofit, which is devoted to supporting music education. And if nothing else, check out the over 200 free play-along videos that I've made at the YouTube channel in the last year since the pandemic uh, began. There's been tens of thousands of students and hundreds of teachers across the country who have been using these to teach during online um, remote learning. And if you have specific requests, I'll even make play long um, videos just for your students and just for your needs. So it's been a pleasure to present, even though we can't be in person this year at ASTA, it's still great to know that we're connecting this way. And I want to thank you for everything you do for the students.